Welcome to the LIC events program uh, for this event held by the Law Department at the LIC and the London Review of International Law. Um, I see I have some evacuation procedures in front of me, Manolis, to announce to the crowd. But, but basically, I'm supposed to say that the exits are precisely like the entry points at the back there. Uh, you can all see them, and that's where you should go if there's an emergency. I believe that this event is being recorded, uh, though there's no absolute guarantee that it will have been recorded when you go to check that. I've been asked to say that as well. And it is, as Philippe and I have already uh, spoken about, being well tweeted. Apparently, it's been counted down for the last five or six hours, you know, six hours to go, five hours to go, four hours to go, three hours to go, and here we are. And, and indeed, here we are. Uh, uh, I want to begin by introducing myself. I'm Gary Simpson. I uh, teach international law at the uh, LSE here. And it's my pleasure to introduce Philippe Sands, who's the professor of international law at uh, UCL, also a very prominent QC, uh, who's argued several, ma many, many cases over the years in various uh, tribunals and courts has written several books, notably Lawless World, uh, Torture Team, uh, and now uh, East West Street of the Origins of Crimes Against Humanity and Genocide, the book under discussion uh, tonight. Now, um, this is an international law event. It's been sponsored by the London Review of International Law. Um, and the book is, to a certain extent, about, of course, international law, but it's about a lot more than that. Uh, it's about the rise of individualism in international law, and it sort of enacts that individualism in its pages because it's about at least four uh, individuals, and it's those four individuals that sort of anchor the book. Um, one of them is Hans Frank, uh, who was the head of the government general area uh, in German-occupied Poland during the Second World War, and in a way, Hans Frank brings the other uh, characters uh, I together um, through uh, a, what one might describe as a sort of gr grotesque form of action. Um, Frank was responsible for the murder uh, of the families uh, of the three other protagonists. So uh, he serves as a central point um, of the book in that regard. And in fact, in some ways, he tries to murder the whole concept of, of the family itself. And Hannah Arendt once said that one of the things that was remarkable about the Nazis is, isn't that they killed many people. They, it was more that they tried to kill the whole concept of what it meant to be a human being. Two of the other individuals are Hirsch Lauterpacht, one of the finest international uh, lawyers uh, of the 20th century who developed the idea of crimes against humanity uh, at Nuremberg and put the individual at the center of international law. Uh, alongside Hirsch Lauterpacht, there is Raphael Lemkin who introduced the term genocide uh, into, our, into our language and he also figures prominently in the book. But Philippe uh, went to Lvov, which is another character in the book, really, the town of Lemberg, the city of Lemberg, Lemberg or Lvov in Galicia, Poland, the Ukraine, it, it changes throughout history. Philippe went to uh, this town to give a lecture on Lauterpacht and Lemkin, and I believe someone came up to you at the end and said, uh, you should be chasing your grandfather. He's, he's the person that you're after. And it's Philippe's grandfather, Leon, who is the fourth character uh, in, this, in this book. But Philippe will say more about the content of the book. I, I, I want to begin with a question um, about, the, about the style or genre of the book. Because it's such a, it's such a curious book. It does so many things uh, so well. It's, it's, it's history, but it's more than history. It's memoir, but it's more than me memoir. It's international law, but it's certainly a lot more than international law. So uh, my first question really is about the response to the book. Um, by these various constituencies. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm particularly curious about historians, uh, first off. You know, how do historians respond to this sort of memoir history? Invasion of turf. Yeah. Um, I'm not a historian. I'm an international lawyer. Uh, 
And so that is my world, nor am I a memoirist or a biographer. Um, I stumbled into writing this book. Uh, I've just had to address the question of how I stumbled into it, because I'm doing a, I've just done a piece with a very good friend of mine, Hisham Matar, who's written a book called The Return. He is Libyan, and he went looking for his father. And we've both been shortlisted for a book prize, and the Guardian asked us to have a conversation about how it felt to be um, co-shortlisted with, with one of your best mates, which has been actually uh, quite fun. And we've addressed the question of why we wrote our respective books. And I came up, in the end, with saying it was a matter of chance and curiosity. Um, I got an invitation from the uh, law faculty in the University of Lviv, and I'm totally delighted that amongst us today is Oksana Holovko from the law faculty at the University of Lviv. Um, and I gave uh, a talk there, uh, and I only accepted the invitation because my grandfather had been born in the city when it was called Lemberg. I was asked to talk about crimes against humanity and genocide. In the course of preparing the lecture, discovered the connection between the city and both men. I had no idea. Indeed, those who invited me had no idea. Most people in Lviv had no idea. I think it's fair to say, uh, Oksana, uh, until I arrived from London bearing the tidings that this was the epicenter of modern human rights and modern international criminal law. But I didn't go to give a lecture. I went to find my grandfather's house. Uh, there was no intention to write about it. There was no intention to write a book, an article, Mm. or anything. It was pure the, the curiosity of a grandson coupled with the chance of receiving this invitation. And as I opened the door to this city, I found it an extraordinary place. And the question that I asked myself first was, how could it be that this place, this remarkable city, gave rise to the two lives who effectively put crimes against humanity and genocide into modern international law in the summer of 1945. What happened in the city? But there was a parallel question that I was addressing, which was, how come I do crimes against humanity and genocide, and what is my connection with this city, which is part of my DNA? So the book addresses those issues. I returned to Lviv about a year later, and shortly after that return visit, my then editor at Penguin said, what's your next book going to be about? Those of you who know what I write know, I'd written a book about Iraq, Lawless World, and then I'd written a book about the Bush administration lawyers. But they were books that were not legal academic books, although they did both get submitted to the REF, and they did OK. But they were books that intended to reach a much bigger audience. There is a very intelligent audience out there who are not lawyers and not international lawyers, and I wanted to touch that audience. Um, and my editor said, what are you going to do? And I gave him a list of three or four things that I'd been involved in. And then I sort of threw out, yeah, and it's really curious. I've been off to this strange place called Lviv, and I came across this funny coincidence that these two guys came from Lviv. And my grandfather came from Lviv, and how weird is that? And he said, that's your book. And so I started writing a book about the three men. And in the course of writing that book about the three men, uh, I discovered that there was this fourth man. Um, so how has it been received by the different communities? Well, the only community that my publishers care about, which is the community of people who buy books, are totally thrilled because a book that was expected to far sell you know, 5,000 copies in hardback and then go into paperback has sold several times over that in the first three months of it having been published, which raises a question that maybe we can come back to of what's going on to cause that interest. I mean, I think I've got answers to that, but we can speculate. So they loved it. My colleagues at UCL loved it and have been incredibly supportive. I have to say, it's wonderful to be part of a law faculty where your investigation of esoteric family history coupled with broader intellectual history is encouraged, not discouraged. Um, my two editors loved it because I 
prove to them, and I take their words, not mine, that I could write um, not like an international lawyer, which that was a compliment. Um, <laughs> that, I was able, <laughs> that I was able to reach out to something that was inside me that touched a different chord. It's the first thing I've ever written that is deeply personal. It is as personal as it gets. Questions of paternity of my mother, questions that are deeply, deeply personal. And it's a difficult thing to write that when you've spent 20 years doing footnotes and stripping the passion and the emotion out of what you write. So basically, the communities I care about the most seem to have been very happy with it. And I've not had any barbs from anywhere except from one place and one person who is a leading historian in the field of the history of the Third Reich, who shall remain momentarily nameless, who wrote the only poor review that the book has that I now wear with a badge of honor. I was sort of a bit miffed when it came out. The reviews have been incredibly generous, and they've been in places I would never have expected. Um, my editor in New York said, um, you've got the cover of the New York Times book review, which is something I think an international lawyer is not normally permitted to imagine could happen. But there was a pretty negative review in The Guardian by a very famous historian uh, who I'd actually interviewed with in Cambridge three weeks before the interview came out. And he'd said, oh, I'm reviewing your book, uh, along with another book, but don't worry. I'm going to treat your book with, it's fine, you're fine. He didn't in the end. He was very nice about the other book and extremely rude about my book. And he called it a first draft, which I thought was, you know, pretty interesting. Actually, I've come to the conclusion it said probably more about him than it did about me or about the book. But what I recognized there was a sort of turf war. Essentially, what that review was saying was, keep out of my territory. You've gone into an area, um, which is my area. You're just an international lawyer and you've gone into a place that's not yours, which of course is not at all what I was <laughs> intending to do. So very nice um, reactions, and it's been very moving to have those reactions. The other thing that's happened for now consistently four months since the book came out is every morning I wake up, I switch on my laptop, and I have four or five emails from people all over the world, deeply personal emails. I've never had that before. I've literally had six or seven hundred emails, um, long emails, um, wanting to talk about things, wanting to share things. So somehow this book mm -hmm. seems to have touched a chord, and it's curious to me how that's happened. I'm, ha I'm very happy with it. I'm certainly not complaining. I reply to every person who writes, which now begins to take quite a long time. But, but it's been a, actually a wonderful experience. I, I would say the only other community that is hugely significant for those who've read the book is the community of my own family. Uh, it is very personal about my mother. My mother was born in 1938, uh, in July, three months after the Anschluss, three months after the Nazis occupied Germany, and she's Jewish, which meant she faced incredible difficulties. And she was taken out of Vienna, uh, put into hiding, and spent the war hidden, uh, but by a series of sort of Catholic individuals and institutions and survived. Um, but most, well, well, out of my grandfather's family, basically no one survived who was in the Via Vojolkio. And so she had never wanted to open that door, a very painful door. And she allowed me to open it, and there was always this trepidation about how she would react. And she's been very happy with it. So, I mean, that raises a question about so this, this, if, this is, if this is some form of genre hopping uh, or turf stealing, where do you go to for um, precedence? Uh, this is perhaps another way of asking you what, what sort of books resembled the sort of book that you imagined yourself writing, either at the beginning of the project or by the time you realized it was going to be this hybrid memoir, history, law. I mean, I'm thinking, I'm thinking of books like The Hair with the Amber Eyes or maybe W.G. Seabolt's The Emigrants. And I know you were very inf influenced by those uh, interwar Europeans like Stefan Zweig. In fact, you, there's, there's a reference to a world of yesterday disappearing, which is, a, is a, a, an allusion to him. 
But I just wondered if, if, I mean, in a way I'm asking you what you were reading, both before you began to seriously write the book and as you were editing it and looking for inspirations. Well, you touched on Stefan Zweig, who I think is one of the great writers of the 20th century. I've read every book he has written, I think, more or less, um, from his novels to his non-fiction. If you want to start with novels, start with Beware of Pity. Uh, and then if you want non-fiction, move straight to the world of yesterday when he writes just as the Second World War is about to begin. It's a moment like now, actually, I think, in Europe and in Britain, uh, of what is being lost. Um, and I was very chuffed when, at one point, my editor... This book was edited out of New York. It was edited by a remarkable editor called Victoria Wilson, um, who is an editor at Alfred Knopf, a very experienced editor. Um, she bought the book in 2012 as a full manuscript of 125,000 words, which I thought was in pretty good shape. Um, I had to do four redrafts, one a year, basically. Uh, it took five years, uh, four and a half years with her. Uh, I would spend nine months doing a full redraft uh, and she would then say, OK, that's good, but here are, you know, 70 pages of comments, and you will completely restructure it. That was actually the condition of buying it. It was interesting. I had d written the book, as I conceived it, as a first draft. In chronological sense, I'd taken the four lives, started in 1914, and finished on the last day of the Nuremberg trial, when the judgment came down. That was the way I did it. So it interwove the four lives. She said, no, the human mind can't cope with information in that way. My condition for buying the book is you will do it in the following way. First, you'll have a part about your grandfather. Then you'll have a part about Lauterpacht. Then you'll have a part about Lemkin. Then you'll have a part about Hans Frank. Each of those parts will go up to the first day of the Nuremberg trial, November the 20th, 1945. And the final part of the book will be the year of the Nuremberg trial, and at that point the reader can understand the four interweaving lives. And it was a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant piece of advice, but that took a year just to restructure the book, and then a rewriting number one, and then a rewriting number two, and then a rewriting number three. So it was a huge endeavor, and you can imagine at times I felt, with my other day jobs, frustrated, but I knew I was in uh, very good hands. At one point, Victoria said, sort of in the middle of the whole project, she said, do you know this, this has a feel of Zweig? This has a feel of Stefan Zweig. And of course, that's probably not an accident because I like the way he writes. It's very, he sets himself slightly back from the subject matter that he's writing and uh, is deeply involved in that which he writes of, but does not express views in a passionate or emotional way, which you'll know is very different from how mm. I am generally in life. So I had to teach myself to write in a different way. Um, so it was informed by the style of writing of that particular uh, period, and I think it took me five years to learn how to write in a different voice, actually, from the one that I had before and from the one that is different from my daily persona. Mm. But it was, it's been a fantastic experience just being in the hands of someone who really knows how to structure a book. I think it's, it, is, it has certain similarities. I, the Seabold is very influential. I love the little pictures in Seabold, and I told my editor early on I wanted to put little pictures in because I thought they were really important in helping to release the imagination because I was quite restrained on emotional issues despite dealing with dark and painful and difficult things. And the hair with amber eyes is an obvious thing, but the person who told me that this book was different from any other book that had been published before, it's his words, not mine, was the writer um, Daniel Mendelssohn who wrote a book called The Lost, and he said the difference with this book is it's not just the usual book about horror and loss, 
it melds the personal and the intellectual in a way that he said I've never seen before. And that theme was picked up again in the New York Times book review. Um, I'd not thought about it in that way until Daniel Mendelssohn, who'd seen a full draft of it, uh, shared that observation. I can't think, and a number of the, many of the reviews have said that, they can't think of another book that melds the personal and the public intellectual, sort of the political story. And I think that's just because of the coincidence that my life, my working life, is so connected to the working lives of the two men who formed the heart of the book. There's just that interplay. I knew none of this when I started writing the book, as you know. Mm. I'm finding it hard to imagine you putting your hands, if, putting yourself in the hands of a publisher or editor quite in that way, which raises the obvious question, were there any, were there any, were there any stylistic or organizational aspects of the book that you had serious disputes or disagreements with the editors about? I mean, were there things that you wanted to do that they really didn't want you to do, or vice versa? So the structure of the book I've just described to you, but, but I felt that it was, ver it was very important for me that the interest of the reader needs to be maintained throughout a text of around 300 pages. And so I came up with the way of doing that, which took some pushing, and that was this. At the heart of the story, the personal story, is a big question of my family, which no one had wanted to talk about. What exactly happened in January 1939? My mother is six months old. She lives with her mother, my grandmother, and her father, my grandfather. They're in Vienna. I had always thought they left together for Paris. But they didn't. In doing the research, I discovered that they had left separately. My grandfather left in January 1939. My, grandmother le my mother left by herself, aged one, in July 1939. How does a one-year-old get from Vienna to Paris? And my grandmother stayed behind. And I wanted to find out what had happened. I, and that was probably more the litigator's instinct than the academic's instinct. I had a sense that something had happened. And so I spent, it took me four and a half years to discover what had happened. Basically a series of love affairs. I had, to, I had two issues I had to address. Who had taken my mother from Vienna to Paris? And that was for me the most moving story of, of the many stories that I uncovered because it turned out it was an evangelical Christian missionary who I've come to admire deeply. And I've come to know her community, actually, in Norwich, who had never told a single person what she had done. But then I had to discover, learn, uncover, understand why my grandmother had stayed behind. And this was, a, for my mother, a very difficult and dark issue. I think she has always lived with the knowledge that her mother did not accompany her from Vienna to Paris, and it's anyone who's a parent will understand, and I think particularly anyone who's a mother will understand, that to not accompany your child out of danger, your one-year-old child at that point, is an overwhelmingly difficult thing to do. And I sensed that something had happened, and I determined that I would find out what had happened, and I did find out what had happened, that both my grandmother and my grandfather had had affairs, but very early on in the marriage. And I ended up discovering who my grandmother had had the affair with, and I came to know her lover's family who now live in New York, which was incredible to um, find in an attic in New York photographs of my grandmother taken in 1941 and 1942 in Vienna that had none of us had ever seen before, of her with another man. Um, so that was obviously incredibly delicate. Mm -hmm. And what I knew I wanted to do was I wanted to reveal that story not at the beginning of the book. I wanted to tell the, that story as the book went along. And so I came up with the idea of interspersing each major part, Lauterpat, Lemkin, with a part of the family story 
And I just know from the reactions of, that I've had from people that it works, that, that it keeps people going along. And so you're propelled along in this curious double dynamic. You want to know what the hell is going to happen to these people at the Nuremberg trial for those three. And then you want to know what on earth happened to this family in parallel that was touched so directly by the events that are being addressed in the courtroom. So I didn't know that at the time that I was discovering all these things. This emerges in the course of writing, in the course of conversation. But Vicky, having come up with a structure, I insisted that I wanted to reveal the family story in that particular way. Mm. The thing is, r reading it as an international lawyer, uh, I knew what would happen at Nuremberg, but I didn't know what would happen to your family. Uh, and it struck me that it read then, just to go back to genre again, as a, as a, as a, it was a detective story in some respects. And, and I had never seen you in this sort of detective mode, uh, uncovering all sorts of amazing facts uh, with every sort of passing, passing page. But there's a lot of documentary stuff in there as well. There's a, there, there are photographs that we need the dates for. There is a piece of paper that simply says Mrs. Tilney, Norwich, Angleterre. Um, so there are, there are artifacts that I think, again, are extremely alluring uh, for the readers. And I suppose this leads me to my next question, which would be, you said there's, there's never been a book like this before, and, and I'm wondering if there can ever be a book like this again, because we, we live in a different age now. Um, I can't imagine in 25, 30 years these sorts of artifacts being around. We either know too much or nothing. We'll either know everything about the photographs because they're readily available, or they simply won't be available at all. Uh, we, we won't live in a world of photographs and letters and artifacts. I, I don't agree with that. I think, I think it will be more of the same, but in a different format and in a different way. I just want to take issue with something, though, that you said. You knew generally about Nuremberg. You knew the big story, the issues in the trial. You knew the outcome. But I'm sure you didn't know the personal dynamic behind what had actually happened. But I didn't know it. I mean, I've taught Nuremberg. I was amazed by the things that I came across. To give you just a couple of examples of a kind of thing, I, I mean, you may tell me you knew about these things, but I'd be very surprised. So, remarkably, Lauter Pact puts the concept of crimes against humanity into the Nuremberg Charter. And Lemkin puts the concept of genocide into the indictment. And Hans Frank is indicted for crimes against humanity and genocide and two other crimes. Lauterpacht and Lemkin are then retained by the prosecution teams, respectively, of the United Kingdom and the United States. Lauterpacht pushes for crimes against humanity against Frank. Lemkin pushes for genocide against Frank. At the point that the trial starts on the 20th of November, in a sort of pre-telephone, pre-internet, pre-communications world, neither man knows the fate of their family. It is only in July 1946 that Lauterpacht learns that his entire family has perished, except for one niece. And at that moment, he realizes that the person he is prosecuting, Hans Frank, he's actually prosecuting for the murder of his own family. Okay, so that is a transformative piece of information because we think of trials as these sort of impersonal things. So pause for a moment and imagine each of you being a prosecutor at Nuremberg and you suddenly learn that the man you are prosecuting or one of the men you're prosecuting is the person who has deprived you of the thing you love most in your entire life, your family. And Lemkin learns the same thing in September. So the way I think about the trial is just transformed by that tiny piece of information. And then let's take it a step further. I learn through Lauterpacht's son, 
Ellie, who gives me access to the correspondence, that Lauterpacht has written to his son in July 1946 on hearing about the news of his family's fate and says, this is a really difficult moment. I'm finding it in overwhelming, actually. Um, I've learned that my entire family has perished, and now I'm writing the closing arguments for Hartley Shawcross, the British Attorney General. And Lauterpacht literally wrote the draft. I mean, literally wrote the entire text of the legal argument. So he was right at the top table of the trial. This is a really serious player. And he says to his son, what helps me get through the day is to listen to the music of Johann Sebastian Bach and in particular, to listen to the Matthew Passion. At the very same moment, in July 1946, Hans Frank tells the US Army psychologist, Dr. Gustav Gilbert, who records it in his diary, that he has begun to sense the full scale of the horror of what has happened. And the intensity of this trial is overwhelming. What helps him get through the day is to imagine that he's listening to the music of Johann Sebastian Bach, and in particular, the Matthew Passion. Okay, so mm. for me, to learn that double fact, that two people are occupying the same space in a courtroom, but on opposite sides of the argument, are finding ways to get through the intensity of this experience through the same means raises some pretty fundamental questions about music, about life. It just struck me that that was fascinating. So I then immersed myself into the Matthew Passion. I didn't know much. I've heard the Matthew Passion. So what do I learn? I learn that the Matthew Passion is actually a revolutionary tract. The difference between genocide and crimes against humanity is that crimes against humanity is the systematic, unlawful killing of large numbers of people. Genocide is the systematic, unlawful killing of very large numbers of people with the intention to destroy the group of which they formed members. So the essential difference between the two is one focuses on the protection of the individual, the other focuses on the protection of the group, and we'll no doubt come back to the complexities of those two ideas. The individual and the group. What is the Matthew Passion about? It's about the individual and the group. It's astonishing. Every chorus in the Matthew Passion is not sung via, we, it is sung ich, I. The Matthew Passion is inspired by Bach's support for the Pietist movement and a form of religious thinking which emphasized the relationship between the individual and God, a direct relationship which bypasses the priest celebrant. In other words, you do not connect with God because you are a member of a group. You connect with God because of your inherent individual qualities. In other words, the same set of debates that are taking place in the Nuremberg courtroom have been addressed 200 plus years earlier in the writing of this piece of music. And that, of course, for me, gives insights into the nature of what's happening in the courtroom. The, the, the point that I'm making is we, we, we think that we know things, but actually the more you immerse yourself in it and the more you move away from you know, the way law was taught for me and how I teach law, and the more you understand that individuals play a crucial role in the development of legal concepts, in the application of the law, in the implementation of the law, and so on and so forth, the more you understand the complexities of how individual moments happen. And I too thought I knew all about Nuremberg, but it was the point of details, the points of detail, that have given me a completely different understanding uh, of, of, of the trial. And I don't think that's going to change. You send emails, you send photographs, we do Instagram, we tweet. Mm -hmm. Me doing the job in 40 years' time, would the, the amount of material mm 
would be voluminous compared to what I had to go through. But I think the fact is human beings like to record things, and we still do it. We just do it in different forms. So I wanted to take you back to, to Frank listening to the Matthew Passion because it's a, it's a theme in, in writing and thinking about these events that people are bemused or astonished or shocked that, as George Steiner put it, somebody could listen to Schubert in the evening and then go to work in Treblinka in the morning. Uh, uh, and it seemed to me that that says something about our concept of what it means to be personally responsible for these sorts of crimes. So uh, again, to go back to Arendt, she goes to, she goes to Jerusalem and she's looking for a particular type of Eichmann um, somebody with Leonard Cohen's five talons instead of fingers and, and, and thumbs and so on. Somebody who's not quite human, somebody who's a monster, and she's disappointed that he's just an ordinary person, a person who might have listened to Schubert and then gone to the camps in the afternoon. So, so there's a, there's a, the idea of putting the individual at the center of international law sort of forces us to confront what sort of individual um, might commit those sorts of crimes. And the book... Is, is interesting on Frank, there's a, there's a discussion about whether Frank might have killed somebody himself. And I think for some people that seems important. Uh, it, 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 we're asking, I mean, did he actually pick up a rifle at one point and shoot a Jewish boy coming out of a manhole? Uh, would that make a difference somehow? And this seems to me to be something that's sort of in the, in the atmosphere. Um, so I suppose my question would be, before we start thinking about putting the individual uh, at the heart of international law, and we'll get to that in a more abstract sense in a second. Uh, but to ask you, know, what sort of individual somehow are we looking for here? I mean, I, I suppose a question that I have long asked myself, and which I have, have never in the past been able to answer, and still today cannot answer, is how can cultured highly educated, civilized individuals do that? Um, it's an impossibly big question. It sort of illustrate the kind of man that Hans Frank was. And again, I actually, I actually think Hannah Arendt got it wrong. There was no banality of the evil here in the sense that they didn't know and fully engage with what they were doing. I think they did know and fully engage with what they were doing. But let me illustrate one example. July 1942. Hans Frank has offered his territory at the Wannsee Conference in Berlin in January of that year for the implementation of the final solution. Take Poland. Take my territory. Put your camps here. I'll sort it all out for you. Six months later in July, he reconnects with his childhood sweetheart, Lily Grau, whose parents very wisely have taken the view 20 years earlier that he's not good enough for their beloved daughter. And so he ends up with someone else. And five children by then. He receives a letter from Lily saying, my son is lost on the Eastern Front. Will you help me find him? You who are so well connected, personal lawyer to Adolf Hitler, can you help me find him? Of course, says Hans Frank. They meet in uh, Munich, and the, as he describes in his diary, and as he tells his wife, the flames of mad passion were instantly reignited. And he then decides immediately that he has to get himself out of his marriage. And he records in a series of letters to his wife, and his wife records in her diary the argument that he comes up with to obtain a divorce. He tells his wife that I am about to get involved in something that is so terrible and so criminal, i.e. the final solution, the murder of European Jewry, that it would be better for you and the children 
if you gave me a divorce to distance yourself from me. So just pause for a moment. I mean, it's literally incredible. If I had not seen the documents in black and white, I could not believe that a person could come up with an argument of using the final solution to have an affair and get rid of your wife. But that is basically what he did. She actually says no. Uh, she writes to Hitler, and Hitler then issues an edict to Frank saying he can't divorce his wife until the end of the war. Now, from that pattern of facts, you can understand a lot about the individual. You can understand a lot about the circumstance. You can understand a lot about the context. But, but you still can't answer the big question, which is how, how can that be done? And I think to get into the question of the role of individuals at these terrible times, and I don't think the Nazis had a particular monopoly on this, I suspect that it goes on you know, in exactly the same way if I were to do the same investigations in relation to the former Yugoslavia or Rwanda or Congo, and I spent a lot of time in relation to Guantanamo, and I spent a lot of time with people who were interrogators at Guantanamo and lawyers at Guantanamo, and they are ordinary, decent, nice folk who you can sit and have a meal with and have a nice natter, but something switches off at a particular moment. And what we can't answer is what conditions cause that switching off to take place. And, and that remains, I think, a very huge question and a very pertinent question right now in this country. Because plainly something is happening right now in this country in relation to foreigners, in relation to the demonization of judges. I think last Friday was as dark a day as I have ever felt in this country a day when a series of newspapers, not just one, describe three senior judges <coughs> as enemies of the people. A headline which I have from a German newspaper of 1933 describing judges in exactly the same way. So there is, mm. you know, who knows where it will head, hopefully not in that direction, but there's something going on. Yeah, let, let's let's get back to that towards the end. Um, but I mean, that, that, that's right. Just to, I mean, I'm sounding like a defender of Arendt here, but that's, I think that is what she meant when she talked about banality. Not so much that it was ordinary, but that it was thoughtless. And, and the striking thing about Eichmann was no, just his no, thoughtlessness no, in some it, way. He just it, didn't, but, but he just didn't reckon with the moral no, consequences no, of what it, he was doing. No, but it wasn't thoughtless. I mean, you, you, in have a you deep seen, sense, no, thoughtless. But, in a deep but, sense. But have you seen the book that that German psychologist, Bettina, I forget her surname, have you read that book? No. It's amazing. <laughs> so she devoted 10 years of her life to getting hold of the material about Eichmann whilst he was in Argentina. And she was able to demonstrate absolutely conclusively in a book of about 700 pages that it wasn't thoughtless. It, it was all, they knew exactly what they were doing. They didn't just slip gently into it. At each stage, they knew that they were slipping from one horror into a greater horror until the greatest horror arrived and it became normalized. And the essence for me of Arendt is that it was thoughtless and it was mindless. And I think from reading that particular book where he, you know, she obtains the documents, the letters he sends to his mates and everything, describing how they went about doing what they did, that, that argument just gets destroyed. It, it, it wasn't thoughtless and it wasn't mindless. And Frank wasn't thoughtless and mindless. <coughs> You know, when you go through his diary, when you go through the correspondence uh, with his wife, when you go through the parallel material for his deputy, Otto von Wechter, they knew exactly what they were doing, and they chose to do it. They were not forced to do it, they chose to do it, knowing what the consequences were. What's extraordinary is how they could turn their minds off to the consequences. And the answer to that, I think, is relatively straightforward that the people who were on the receiving end of this activity were simply not human beings. Mm. And that's a common theme in Rwanda, in Congo, in, in Yugoslavia, I just in Guantanamo, in Bagram, in Afghanistan. There comes a point 
where the human mind, it, for some reason, is able to determine that certain categories of people have not all or none of the qualities that entitle them, entitle them to the protections and the decencies we accord to a fellow human being. And I think that's, that's the, the, the crucial slippage that takes place. Mm, mm. Yes, because she, to go back to our rant again... <laughs> <laughs> bat on, he's going to bat on. ...says that, that the essence of thoughtlessness is the inability to, to, to observe this Kantian imperative, to, 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 to put yourself in somebody else's shoes and somehow imagine the effects of your actions on that other, other person. But let me, let me go back to Frank then, and, and something else about Frank that I found really curious, which is that he's extremely legalistic. So one of the uh, one of the things we often hear about the about uh, about Nazi war the, the Nazi era though it's not universally the case is that it was lawless. Um, but Frank, but of course it was very lawful. There were edicts and laws being passed all the time. Frank seemed peculiarly legalistic. I mean, so legalistic that he gets himself into trouble with Himmler uh, and Hitler by calling for judicial independence. This is a sort of weird dissonant legalism <laughs> in the midst of what's happening in Poland at that time. But it's there. Um, now, you could just describe it as hypocrisy, but in, in, a, in a really interesting passage of the book, you, you, you describe how risky it was for Frank to take up this legalism. Frank was a lawyer. He defended, he defended Hitler. He seemed to have some sort of idea about law. It's not as if he thought of law as entirely instrumental. He's not a Lauterpachtian, mind you, either, but, but he, has a, he has an idea about law. He wants to put things on a legal footing. He wants to make sure that judges are somehow independent, independent Nazis. It's, it's, it's hard to imagine what that might mean. Um, but I wonder, I wonder what you thought of this legalism and what sort of legalism it is. I mean, it's, well, it's, hired, it's reputable, of course. He hired Carl Schmidt. Um, and you know, Carl Schmidt was his great protege, and Carl Schmidt became the great theorist um, for that uh, for that era. Schmidt, um, Schmidt's apparently a great theorist for this era too. He's back. He's all over the place. Yeah, yeah. he's back. No, uh, Frank was highly legalistic. In the summer of 1942, as he's having his meltdown with his wife and offering his territory to be used for killing millions of people, he also decides that this is the right moment to visit the four great law faculties in Germany, Mer Berlin, Heidelberg, Munich, and deliver essentially the same lecture on the vital need for an independent judiciary because he's worried that judicial independence is being undermined. So he's basically all over the place mm. because on the one hand, you go through his diaries, he's giving these speeches, and on the other hand, he's uh, issuing orders for a thousand poles to be executed for not having, you know, or for having you know, put up a flag on Polish Independence Day. Um, so it's impossible, virtually impossible, um, to explain um, the, the disconnect between his actions often on the same day. I like to think of him on the day that he got the indictment, which was October the 18th, 1945. He would have received his indictment, he would have opened it, and he would have seen he's been indicted for crimes against humanity and genocide, two terms that he has never before ever come across. Um, they have been invented for the trial, and he would have thrown a wobbly and he would have told his lawyer, Dr. Alfred Seidel, this is the retroactive application, as he did argue, that is subjecting me to legal norms that were not in force at the time that I did the acts that I'm alleged to have been involved in. And that was part of his defense, which he organized also for the other defendants. So the legalisms cut in um, at all of these periods. Ironically, his interest in such legalisms has, you know, an unhappy but nevertheless a theoretical basis. So, so to take another moment, the summer of 1935, he organizes a congress of his beloved Deutsches Akademie für Recht, the German Academy of Law. And he uh, organizes a congress 
on the subject of international law. And he invites, as one of the key speakers to that Congress, a French professor from the University of Paris, Henri Donadieu de Vabre, professor of criminal law. And Donadieu de Vabre gives a speech in the summer of 1935 on the need for an international criminal court. You really couldn't invent it, actually. Um, and Frank offers his response to the Congress. This is a complete nonsense for the following 97 legal reasons, that it cannot possibly work. It's not a rant. He's worked out all mm. sorts of legal arguments and policy legal arguments as to why this can't happen. Press the pause button and fast forward 10 years and he's in the dock on the 20th of November 1945. Nine o'clock comes, door opens, the judges walk out, and one of the judges is Henri Donnige de Vabre, okay, who has failed to declare his relationship with Hans Frank, mm. which the Soviets get very uppity about. Fast forward a year later, when it comes to the moment to decide on the sentence for Hans Frank for having um, committed crimes against humanity and war crimes, although not genocide, which as you know does not appear anywhere in the judgment. And Donnie de Vabre, according to the notes of Francis Biddle, which I found in an archive at Syracuse University, was the only one of the judges, the four principal judges, who voted against the death penalty for Hans Frank. And then in Francis Biddle's handwriting, at that point in the notes, it simply says, Frank curiously tender, uh, Donny de Vabre curiously tender towards Frank. And you can understand in that moment that that point of connection between the two, um, there was still a degree of respect, I think, mm. from Donnie de Vabre towards Frank for the fine lawyer he believed Frank to be, who had somehow been sucked up into some greater horror that was not entirely of his making and of his doing. But right to the end, mm. Frank defined himself as a lawyer, deeply attached to the rule of law, and thought the Nuremberg trial was a travesty and that he was being tried for things that were not crimes at all and should not be crimes, before a tribunal that should not exist. De Vabre is, in fact, described as a Nazi judge by a socialist newspaper in France at one point in the, in the book yeah. as well. Um, and, and Frank self-described as a legal theorist, a bit like Manolas and I. It's, it, there is something very, very, there's something very chilling about it. And I want to, I want to stick with Frank for a bit and, and, and go to, 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 to Frank's son, who's, who's, who's really a major, a major character in the, in the book, uh, uh, Nicholas Frank, who of course you befriended. But, but, but before, before I go to Nicholas Frank, I, I wanted to ask about Lauterpacht, and, and, and in particular Lauterpacht's approach to the, to the problem of novelty. And it wasn't just Hans Frank, of course, that described uh, Nuremberg justice as retroactive and Victor's justice. I mean, you hear this, you, you hear this all the time. Um, Lauterpacht was a very strict professional sort of lawyer as well. So how did he go about reconciling the apparent innovations, unprecedented novelties in the trial and the need to observe non-retroactivity, rule of law, legalism, and so on? Without much difficulty. Um, a necessary innovation um, to deal with the peculiarities of the situation. I mean, his legal argument was essentially the crimes that we have identified, crimes against humanity. He was always against... Lauterbach was completely against the concept of genocide because he believed that genocide would lead to the replacement of the tyranny of the state by the tyranny of groups. And I think he's sort of been shown to be right by that. So he just put genocide on one side, said it's impractical, it's a nonsense, we don't want to deal with that stuff. We'll focus on the individual. 
and he justified its inclusion on the grounds that it was merely a label for something that pre-existed, and therefore it could be justified. But when it goes into the Nuremberg Charter on the 6th of August 1945, he's sufficiently bothered about it to write a memo to the Foreign Office in London from Cambridge where he's living to say, well, you know, it's a bit iffy and this is the retroactive application, but hey, it's a special situation and we just have to deal with the necessities of that situation. So they, they knew they had a problem and they found a way to skirt around it. And reviewing that kind of material, I ask myself the question, what would I have done if I had been there? And I suspect I would have done exactly the same thing. You know, special moments call for special measures. Um, and uh, I like to think that perhaps I might have argued, oh, you know, retroactivity, you can't do this, blah, blah, blah. But actually, the circumstances were so acute in relation to these individuals that I think one can understand why what happened, happened. Do we have any sense about what Leiter Pact thought of the, of the um, three acquittals? Because the Soviets dissented. They were furious that the three of the leading Nazis were acquitted. And yet again, many people have pointed to these acquittals as evidence that this really was a trial held under, under rule of law conditions. Uh, I think it's, it's not seen as a stain on the, on the trial's reputation that three of these individuals were acquitted. But the prosecution, it, it sounded to me from reading the book, the, the prosecution regarded that as a bit of a failure for them. Disaster. It's not entirely clear what Lauterpach thought of that. Um, I don't think Lauterpach was too bothered um, about the three acquittals. The prosecution as a whole, Lauterpach was an academic member of the prosecution team. The, the prosecution leaders, Jackson, Shawcross, Maxwell Fife, the Soviet, the French, Derib, all wanted everyone convicted and everyone executed. And anything less than 21 hangings would be a disaster. Of course, we now look at it differently and we now see the acquittals and the fact that half those convicted got sentences of imprisonment rather than sentences of execution as a good thing. But at the time, it was seen as a PR disaster. Interestingly, again, very different from, mod very different from domestic law and very different from modern international law, one hopes, up to a point, um, the prosecution teams and the judges were doing a lot of socializing together. And they would talk about these things at dinner parties. And there would be the kinds of exchanges that simply could not take place in a modern legal system. I was very dis surprised to discover, for example, I came to know the grandson of Jeffrey Lawrence, uh, who was the presiding judge, uh, Patrick Lawrence, who gave me access to um, the, the, the scrapbooks his grandmother, Marjorie Lawrence, kept. They're really amazing documents that reside in Wiltshire, four volumes. She kept a daily scrapbook of every day of the trial. And she would include things like dinner menus, and you'd see from the signatures at the bag that the psychologist and the prosecutors and the judges were all going to dinner parties together and sharing special festive occasions. But also included in the scrap, scrapbooks, amazingly, are poems that the prosecutors would pass up to the bench, either during the course of the hearings or before court or after court, about how terrible some of the defendants were and these things. And Lady Lawrence pasted, pasted them into the scrapbook. So they're all there to be seen. In other words, the idea that Nuremberg met sort of modern standards of justice or even modern standards of international justice is just plainly not the case. It was a different world, and we would be very troubled by that. But it was what it was. It was the first time 
in human history that an international tribunal had been set up in this way. Uh, and it was a sort of succulency uh, effort um, to, to work it out. I mean, I don't critique them strongly uh, for what happened. It was done basically in a year. It was cobbled together under extraordinary moments um, of, of difficulty, and they cut corners. They cut a lot of corners. And that is how it is. It's all available to be seen, and um, you know, you, each of you will form your own views as to the adequacies of the whole thing. Manolis, how are we doing for time? We're so we'll open up for questions fairly soon, um, but I still have some more questions. Uh, so you and I have spoken before about the fact that in some ways it's the early persecutions that are the most important to be attentive to in relation to modern politics. It's the it's sort of early humiliations of a group, the sort of marking of a group. So Raoul Hilberg in his great in his great book about the destruction of the Jewish people in Europe, you know, marks the various phases, the identification, the persecution, and then the camps. And by the time we get to the camps, it's, it's in, a, in a way it's too late. So it seems important that lawyers be extremely attentive to the sorts of things that we have to be attentive to if we, if we read back in history. And when we see a headline like the enemies of the state headline, we think about these moments. Or when I read in your book, for example, that the, uh, um, the authorities had required all foreign Jews to be identified and to cease work, it reminded me a little bit of some of Theresa May's statements in recent times. I mean, one, one just is alarmed by that. So Raphael Lemkin, who we haven't had time to speak about very much, was very keen for those persecutions, I think, to be included, uh, both in the indictment and in the judgment. Lauderpag wasn't. He wanted, the, he wanted the thing to really begin in 1939, as far as the law was concerned. And, and, and of course, the, the charter restricts the application of crimes against humanity and genocide to, in effect, to a period between 1939 and 1945. So no war, no jurisdiction over genocide. Um, and again, that slightly, that, that surprised me a little bit. That, that's where Lauterpach's legalism kicks in. Uh, he thinks that going back beyond 1930, he, he wants to break into the state. He wants to say the German state can't sit there and say, it's all about sovereignty, whatever we do to our own people doesn't matter. But on the other hand, uh, when, when the state says it's, there's no war, uh, it's a period between 1936 and 39. we can't allow international law in here at that point, Lauterpack seems to surprisingly agree. Yeah, he does. They were two very different men. Um, one of the things that I have thought about a lot is what caused the difference. Why would two men who passed through the same law faculty come up with such diametrically opposed ideas in answer to the question, how can the law protect against mass atrocity? One focuses on the individual, one focuses on the group. Their backgrounds are broadly similar, except that Lauterpacht has a more bookish urban life and Lemkin is a more rural life. As you follow their paths through life, there's a certain paradox Lauterpacht is the consummate insider, teaches here at the LSE uh, from 1928 uh, until 1937, before going up to Cambridge, by which point he's become a member of the English Bar and is dispensing legal advice and does not hold on his sleeve his origins, either Polish or Jewish, although his accent gives away a lot. So the consummate insider, the one who feels the warm, protective embrace of the establishment group, opts for the protection of the individual. The outsider, Lemkin, who has no establishment credentials, is treated as a pain in the ass by most people on the prosecution team, constantly peddling his ideas about genocide, embraces the protection of the group of which he's not a member. I engage in a little bit of speculation, but not very much, about why that might be. That's not a question really for lawyers or even historians. Um, but one of the things, for example, I was very struck by in relation to Lemkin 
was that the only group of which he made no mention, despite the fact that he had material available to him on the persecution of that group, was the group he would have described as homosexuals. There is no reference I have found to Lemkin of that group. And with other materials that I've put together, including conversations with people who know him, including the woman who was his last assistant in 1959 when she was a student at Barnard College in New York, is that I think probably Lemkin was gay and that that explains the reason why he did not address that particular group. He was an absolute obsessive about his idea. What he does in his book, Axis Rule, published in November 1944, is go methodically through the stages that lead to what he called genocide in chapter nine of his book. And it's a sort of model for what to be alert to, how it begins, and how one step logically leads to the next step. Because once the dogs are off the leash, there's no putting them back on the leash. And he traces that, not only in his own country, but from Sweden, where he has taken refuge in 1941, and later at Duke University Law School in North Carolina, to where he has fled, in the spring of 1941, he gathers every decree he can find from across the entirety of Nazi-occupied Europe and spends two years analyzing those decrees on his own. I mean, it's an, a remarkable exercise in research. Unbelievably, no one else has done that. No government is doing it. It's left to one mm. ill-paid, lonely individual to engage in this particular activity. And that book, reading that book, which is meticulous, leads you to see what the early warning signs are when things begin to go wrong. I mean, it may be that I've been too immersed in that period to see the wood from the trees right now as to what is going on. But since you allude to it, it's impossible for me to listen to a speech by Theresa May, in which she says, if you claim to be a citizen of the world, you are a citizen of nowhere. To listen to a speech by Amber Rudd, in which she announces that foreign employees of companies, by which I assume she means universities, and LSE and UCL will be covered by it, and half my colleagues would therefore be listed, is exactly what happened in the 1930s. One of the anecdotes that you refer to is a moment in 1943 where my grandfather's Parisian employer is ordered by the Gestapo to fire all foreign Jews. Okay, so that, when I hear Amber Rudd talk about the listing of foreigners, that's what I think of. Because once you've got that list, we know what can follow, not necessarily will follow. Mm. And I think we are now in this country in that dynamic. Something very bad has unleashed, and I've seen it firsthand. I've seen it with some of my juniors. Five days after Brexit, the junior I work with the most, who is Indian and lives in Delhi, and comes to London when we have consultations, attended a consultation with me not 500 metres from where we are now in Gray's Inn. And she arrived for a consultation with the foreign government a bit shaken up because, as she explained, just outside Matrix Chambers, 10 minutes earlier, she had been racially abused on the street. She has been coming to this country since she was a student at UCL 18 years ago and she has never felt anything. So that was the first time. And we can feel that there is something that is going on. And I think we have to respond very, very loudly about what we do about it. Um, I don't know where we draw the line. So I got invited to speak at the largest history festival 
in the United Kingdom, the Chalk Valley History Festival in July 2017. And I got a lovely letter a few weeks ago inviting me to be on a big panel and to talk and blah, blah, blah. And they proudly declaimed that they were sponsored, that their media partner was the Daily Mail. So on Friday, I sort of, I wrote to the lovely man who had invited me, full of enthusiasm, and said, look, I really, really need to think through whether I want to come, because, having accepted, because I really object to what the Daily Mail has done. I don't want to be associated with the Daily Mail in any way at all. I just think we have to be incredibly clear about it. And he then wrote back and said, look, it's just incredibly difficult. You're not the first one to have done this. You're not the first one to have said this. Um, I'm begging you to come. I'm paraphrasing, but please come because we need to have a range of voices. And that's the alternative argument. Things become ghettoized. People decide they're not going to be involved with events with the Daily Telegraph or the Daily Express or the Daily Mail because they're basically racist, xenophobic, anti-foreign, and whipping up the kinds of storms that is going to lead to a lot of people in this room being thrown out of this country. That's what's going on. That is what the agenda is. That is what is going on. So what do you do? Do you engage or do you not engage? So I suppose in the end you do, if you engage, you engage and you turn up and you lambast the Daily Mail as the sponsor while you are there. And you basically tell people in the audience, who come in their thousands apparently, that if you read the Daily Mail, I don't want you to buy my book. I'm not going to sign your book if you read the Daily Mail. And I just think we've got to begin to find ways to say it is unacceptable. I don't know how you do that. I've thought a lot about how it was for my grandparents' generation. What do you do when it begins? Do you do a sort of inner emigration, like Hans Faluda, and just say, oh, it's all terrible. I, I, I'm, I have a good life. I'm going to stay in my little corner and just, you know, get on with my fine, happy life and just not think about these things, or am I going to agitate? And I think we have to agitate. I think it's just not good enough to say, no, well, you know, we're fine, it's not our problem. It is our problem, it's everyone's problem. And I think that when you read material from that period and see how it begins, there are grounds for very, very serious concern right now. I meant to say at the beginning, Philippe will be signing books. Uh, what if you uh, read uh, the Daily Mail? <laughs> Just for Guardian readers uh, outside afterwards. No, the Times. Uh, no, no, you're, you're the a times, very, you're the very Times is okay. You're, you're very ecumenical. <laughs> I know that, but I think it might be time to open this conversation up. We could go on all night like this. Uh, we, we often do, but we yeah. shouldn't. Um, so, so what I've been asked to do the, the, again, there are instructions from the LSE about how to do a Q and A. I, I do know how to do a Q and A. One of the things they say is you mustn't make a speech uh, from the floor. So try not to make a speech. Uh, try to keep your questions fairly short. And what I think we'll do is, and this, though this may be optimistic, is take them in clusters of, of, uh, of two or three. So can I, have, uh, can I ask if anyone feels courageous enough to ask a question? Yeah, up the back there. Um, is that me? That is you. Yeah, that's you. And um, <laughs> did, uh, did the bad guy get his, uh, his old flame back and, and indeed the son of who was lost at the front? That's it. The yeah. personal question. Yeah. Uh, now, there's a question down here. Yeah. I'll try to make it very short. That was a wonderful talk. But uh, what role does the concept of empathy have in international law? Thank you. The role of empathy in international law. Okay, a couple of questions, one and then one behind, and then that'll be. Thanks. That, that will be uh, and also on international law and international treaties and agreements more generally, do you think, given ideological and political trends, that they have a future, <laughs> such as um, countries withdrawing from the International Criminal Court, a certain American presidential candidate threatening to tear up the Paris climate? change agreement treaty if he wins, the very clear agenda from Vladimir Putin um, to reassert national sovereignty as against international laws and norms. 
And then a question just behind you, and then we'll, Thank we'll, you we'll ask. Well, actually, that man did refer to the question. I've got the International Criminal Court. Its future, it seems to have been that I'm, I think I'm right, only Africans have been prosecuted so far, and that some people are saying that's racial prejudice. It's not, um, uh, you know, um, un neutral as it should be. So if you could say something, that man also referred to it, the future of the International Criminal Court and international law and justice. Excellent, thank you. Um, in no, well, I'll go back, I'll go for them in the same order. Yes, um, they did. They were reunited, my grandfather and grandmother, in 1942. And by the time I came into the world, they were still living together. Not, I would say, in particular happiness. Uh, and I noticed that as a child. And the book begins with my recollections of visiting them and spending uh, time uh, w with them. Um, I didn't, of course, understand, know about what they had been through uh, because no one wanted to talk about it. I, and I'm sure there are other people in the room, from different parts of the world who will know that when traumas happen of that kind, and there's nothing, I think, particular about the one uh, that happened in Europe, it's exactly the same experience if you are a Yazidi today in northern Iraq uh, or Syria, uh, or if you are um, in Rwanda or the Congo or Yugoslavia. I I've seen for myself that the same patterns follow in terms of silence um, things would not get talked about. But as a child, you had a sense uh, of um, that, that things, something was not right. There were no photographs and there was no laughter in the apartment next to the Gare du Nord in which they grew up. So you sensed as a child that something had happened, but you were respectful and so you did not... Uh, ask. You had a second question in relation to uh, after An the. Empathy. No, no, you, no but the, the, you, oh, yeah, you wanted yeah. another factual thing, but I can't remember what it was. Oh, no, no, he, he didn't. He didn't. He didn't. Um, <laughs> empathy in international law. Yes, it definitely has um, a place. Um, it doesn't have a formalized place. Um, I think empathy is reflected in the handwritten note of Judge Donadieu de Vabre in relation to the sentence uh, to be handed down to Hans Frank. And if Donadieu had managed to persuade one other judge to join him, uh, he would not have hanged uh, as he did. Uh, so I know from my own work, sitting as an arbitrator in various international cases, that empathies do pl play a role in a way that's often not articulated in dealing with witnesses or in dealing with counsel or in dealing with parties, but it's not a formalized role. I, I suppose what I'm saying is that, contrary to general public belief, lawyers are human beings, <laughs> and they form connections across a courtroom, in a courtroom, in ways that are not verbalized, which I think influence proceedings. There is a form of communication that takes place in a courtroom that is significant, but is not subject to words. I feel it when I'm arguing a case at an international court in The Hague or in Hamburg, you are communicating with judges in other ways, body language, Something is, something is going on. So yes, I think it does play a role. Um, future of international law, absolutely. International law is here to stay, but my own thesis about how international law is made is that it only gets made truly at moments of great disaster and hardship. And so we're now in the sort of step back before there will be two steps forward and there will be some great disaster that will occur and there will be an effort to unravel, which is what's going on now, the structures of 1945. I mean, I think the ICC, Brexit, attacks on the European Court of Human Rights are all part of a general disdain for a settlement that was essentially put in place in the period 1945 to 1950. 
Why that is happening is difficult to understand or to know precisely, but one of the factors is the generation that remembers that period has gone and is no longer actively involved. And those who are now in power, including those responsible for the shambles that is government in the United Kingdom, have no sense of history. And they somehow think that the world we occupy today, in a sense, can be taken for granted. The thing that I learnt the most in writing this book, having spent time immersed in this incredible city of Lviv, Lvov, Lemberg, is that you see <coughs> the community that existed in that city, a deeply multicultural community, which existed in relative harmony for a relatively long period of time, was utterly destroyed. Those people thought, as we think, that we can take for granted the structures that we have, the protections that we have, we can't, and we shouldn't, and we mustn't. Their world was swept away by a series of forces that were uncontrollable. It happened then, and it plainly can happen again. In relation to the ICC, thank you for that question, because I think it's a very important um, question. International criminal justice is lopsided. And it comes back to what we were discussing before. It was lopsided at Nuremberg, and that put in place a lopsidedness that has persisted ever since. We can applaud and celebrate developments like the Yugoslav Tribunal and the Rwanda Tribunal and the ICC up to a point, but the reality is, as Balzac would have put it to paraphrase him, international law is a, like a spider's web. The small insects get caught and the large ones manage to pass through or to escape. And the failure to indict anyone who is not African at the International Criminal Court is shocking. And it is not an accident. And it sends a terrible signal. And it is proper to characterize it not just as lopsidedness, but a form of institutional racism, not intended by the decent people who run the institution and who seek to prosecute, or the judges, because of the way in which the referrals have been made and the cases have got there. But Africans do not have a monopoly on international crime. And the fact that no one else has been indicted at the ICC, I think, is a sad indictment 70 years after Nuremberg that we have not made much progress in our delivery of an international criminal justice system. Okay, well, we've probably got time for one absolute blockbuster final question, if, anyone's, if anyone has that question. In which, case, in which case, I had a prior agreement with Philippe that I wouldn't describe his book as magnificent, but it is magnificent, and you should go out and buy it and have it signed. It's not really about the one or the many, I decided as I reread it on the train this morning on the way down from Glasgow. It's about a special sort of tragedy. <coughs> Stalin once said that one person's murder was a tragedy, a, a million deaths are a statistic. This book is about the special tragedy of the killing of families and the murder of families. And, and we don't really have a name for that in international law, but that's in a sense what the book's about. Not quite the one, not quite the many, but the group to which we feel most strongly uh, affiliated. Apparently when the Paris Review interviewed Vladimir uh, uh, Nabokov, the reviewer said, I have 33 questions. <laughs> and Nabokov replied, I'm ready. Well, you were ready tonight, Philippe, and we're all immensely grateful for your presence here, for your answers to the questions, and most of all for this magnificent book. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.